Okay. Okay. Your loved one is extremely ill, and without an organ transplant, they will die. You have two options. You can be put on a wait list and tell that special someone to hold on, or illegally obtain an organ from the elusive black market. Everyone has had a family member or friend in the hospital. Everyone knows at least one person who might have needed a major surgery, including a transplant. You always want to help them right away. Eight months ago, I lost a family member who was not able to receive a transplant in time. Today, I will urge you to support the legalization of human organ sale. First, I will demonstrate the need to change the current system. Second, I will propose a policy to meet that need. And third, I will give you a picture of the possibilities that could come. So first, an unyielding number of people on the transplant list die or get taken off before a match can be found. According to Richard Knox, an NPR correspondent who attended the 2000 debate at the Intelligence Squared US series, where they discussed this topic, in the United States alone, 75,000 people need a kidney transplant. However, only 18,000 will receive one. That's a one in four chance. To break it down even further and more close to home, in Arizona, as of last month, the US Department of Health and Human Services reports that 6,900 transplants for various organs were needed. However, 4,900 died before they were able to receive an organ in time. That's 71%. So you can have a better idea of what this looks like. Here's a graph I made for the United States. So this is the number of people currently on the wait list, and this is the number of transplants available to them as of this year. And then for Arizona, this was the number of people who needed a transplant, and this was the number of people who died as of last month. Intervention is needed to bring these numbers down, and it's needed today. Now that we've identified an obvious problem, let's look at a possible solution. The sale of human organs should be legalized, bottom line. With this, a third party organization would be funded, maintained, and regulated solely by the government and medical community. A facility and process similar to that of the United Network of Organ Sharing, also known as UNOS, would be put in place. There would be board certified doctors and surgeons always on staff to perform these surgeries. Most importantly, there would be a numerous number of standardized tests to ensure that the individual donating and selling is qualified. For example, a seller couldn't be terminally ill, currently have a treated or untreatable disease, a history of disease in the family, drug addicts, things like that. The assurance of quality, ready to transplant organs, would be the mission of this policy. NPR coverage of the same debate states that Sally Sattel, a psychiatrist and resident scholar at the Enterprise Institute, who is also a form, firm believer of supporting this, is quoted, many people need more of an incentive to give, and that's why we need to be able to compensate people who are willing to give a kidney to a stranger to save a life. We're not talking about classic commercial free-for-all or free market like eBay. We're talking about a third-party payer. For example, today you decide to give a kidney, you'd be called a good Samaritan. The only difference in that model is that once you give your organ, your retirement account is wired a certain sum. End of story. Based on the evidence I just gave you, this is a win-win scenario for all parties involved. Not only do the people who can afford these transplants get them, but those who can't and must wait on the list have a greater chance of getting their organ before it's too late. Now that I've proposed this policy, let me explain the benefits when you choose to support it. With the sale of human organs, more people are given the opportunity to live. The goal of a policy like this is to dramatically decrease the number of unnecessarily deaths brought about due to lack of the resources. Instead of that 71% dying here, what about 50? Then maybe as the years increase, what about 40, 30, 20, and 10? Edward Nelson, who is the author of Financial Incentives for Organ Donation, says, 
Arguments in favor of financial incentives for organ donation are founded in the hope that such a system would increase the supply and therefore secure basic ethical concern of saving lives that may otherwise be lost due to lack of resources. According to UNOS, the average wait time for an organ match is four years. With a policy in place of human organ sale, those four years have the potential of being less than one. If we have the power to give individuals, strangers or not, the gift of life, then let's create a world where that's possible. Now that I've showed you the positive outcome, let's review. Today, I urge you to support the legalization of human organ sales. First, I demonstrated the need. Second, I explained how a policy like mine would work. And third, I gave you the possibilities of a brighter future. You don't want to lose a loved one because there's just not enough time or resources available. With such, an, such a technologically advanced society, we shouldn't have to go through a traumatic experience like this. To support this policy or one like it, I have a paper in the back where there's two main petitions that you can go to. I encourage you to educate those around you, sign the petitions, so we can take the first step into making that brighter future. When the loved one's in the hospital, wouldn't it be nice to know that telling them hold on was no longer considered a false pretense, but a true sign of hope and a true sign of life. Travis, will you be back before the next speaker? Okay. Am I next You are! Yay! Does anybody in this room, I love these. Can I have these? These were fabulous. Look at that. That was good. Wasn't that good? Simple, yet so powerful. Uh, does anybody in this classroom have a GPS software of any kind on an iPhone, a watch, anything like that? On a watch? I have a GPS, I have a regular GPS in my car. You do? Yes. Yeah. Can you hand hold it? Can you hold it in your hand and walk with it or does it have to be in the car? Um, well. Actually, it doesn't matter. Would it be accurate if you're driving? Is the distance dead on? It's GPS, right? Yeah. It's Could I ask you after class if you have 10 minutes to go drive around something and tell me how far it is? I just need you to make one loop around a parking lot. Okay. It sounds really weird, but I'd be really appreciative. <laughs> Wait, you, uh, I'll give you extra credit. What am I? I'm, I'm calculating the, the distance. The how distance. Far it is? Yep. I need to map out a course, and I don't want to double check my course because I haven't done it with GPS, and I need to make sure it's accurate. I, I think I, yeah, I think that. Because we should be out of here a little bit early, so I don't think you'd be okay. late. If you don't want to, so, you don't no, have to. No, that's cool. <laughs> I'm just not, I, 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 just like how, how, how many miles it is? You can do it. Exactly. Okay. So I'll have you drive around in a circle, and I just need you to tell me where is, where one mile is. So if we start here, and you go around, where's one mile? I got you. Okay. So. Hopefully it'll be quick and painless. And sure. So anyways, they do have GPS watches, by the way, Travis. Sure. Garmin makes GPS watches for runners. I guess it makes sense. But yeah, it does seem very oh, high tech. Where am I? I was like, where track. am I? I don't, <laughs> I don't know what time it is. I know where I am, though. <laughs> I'm running I, so hard. I, I look so around, hard. but I'm I don't know what sure state I'm in track. anymore. I've been here for too long. Hey, I ran 16 miles last Saturday, and I got lost. It was not fun. Whoa. Tired and cranky and lost. <laughs> Sweaty, no water. It's a problem people like me will never have. <laughs> All right, Tanya, are you ready? Yeah. Go ahead. It's Thanksgiving. You're having a delightful dinner with your family, complete with a turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy, and corn on the cob. After everyone is done, you stow the uh, leftovers in the refrigerator and you throw the turkey carcass and corn cobs into the trash. The very next day, you receive a fine for $100. In San Francisco, this is a very real situation because compost recycling is mandatory. Because we are to blame for the damages leading to our failed environment, it's our responsibility to eliminate our negative impact on the earth. 
After all, we only have one, and we must leave it healthy for future generations. As an avid recycler, I've researched many government sites, statistics, and articles concerning composting. So today I'm going to tell you why composting should be made mandatory in Arizona. First, I will tell you about biodegradable waste in landfills. Second, I will propose a